So this is a actually a really critical point is that we're going to see this this simplification process is going to start. And the way the people listening to this are going to experience it is things just get harder, right? You know, there's just like, you know, they can't quite find the budget. We can't do everything we want. We can't fight wars, cut taxes, and, you know, go in further in a deficit. Just It just becomes harder. We're not ready for that, as a, again, as a culture. So that's why I do what I do. I want individuals to understand what they can do, because this isn't a, this sounds dark, but it's, it's just a change. It's going to be dark for people who don't see it coming, can't adapt to it, um, are inflexible. But for people who see it coming, I actually think this is going to be one of the greatest periods of wealth creation and transfer in human history. And so to see that... I've had four big inspirations when it comes to my professional life and what I really believe. And that was, first of all, the book from Milton Friedman, Free to Choose. Secondly, the Econ Talk podcast, which I've been listening to for uh, since about 2006. And then there was the newsletter, The Daily Reckoning, which is sort of the sister publication of Fortune and Freedom. And last but certainly not least, we have the Chris Martinson Crash Course which is why I'm very delighted to tell you that we've got Chris Martinson on the Fortune and Freedom podcast with us today. Thanks very much for joining us, especially so early in the morning, Chris. Oh, my pleasure, Nick. It's great to be here with you. And, and thanks for that, uh, putting me on a, on a pantheon consisting of four things. That's lovely. <laughs> so I can remember when you first released the crash course, I think it was 2008. I was at university and everything I was learning about was being disproven in the media every single day. All of the finance and economics lectures were a load of rubbish, basically. And then my dad, I think, sent me your crash course. And I watched it, I learned a lot, and suddenly everything that was playing out in 2008 and that has been playing out since, actually, suddenly started to make sense. What allowed you to see things differently? Oh, uh, that's easy. I, I, um, I got rid of my TV. <laughs> we, uh, we, we lost our TV, as it were, when we started homeschooling our children. And uh, I just started researching. I'm, I'm just a researcher. So, so actually, the origin story of seeing things differently was 2001. You know, I'm just like everybody else. I'm, I'm reaching for the brass ring. I've done everything I'm supposed to. I have a PhD, an MBA. I'm a vice president of a company. And then my portfolio is getting shredded, right? I was a genius all through investing in the 90s. And then suddenly, I wasn't a genius. But um, uh, I realized that something was wrong with that story. I started researching. I read this book called Creature from Jekyll Island by G. Edward Griffin, which finally explained how the money system works. I couldn't believe it, Nick. I got an MBA. They teach you how to compete for money. They teach you how to chase that ball in the arena, but not how the arena was built. Once I got my hands on that, everything, I started reading all kinds of other material, including Daily Reckoning, a lot from uh, Bill Bonner, Empire of Debt was a great book. Uh, that really helped me understand that once you understand how the banking system works, light bulbs started going off. I realized, oh, we have a banking system that works perfectly well as long as it's growing constantly. And I was like, well, are there any things that could maybe put a dark cloud on that sort of a model? And the answer is, yeah, there certainly are. And that's where the crash course came from. Yeah, that's what you're hinting at is this limit to growth. But it's, it's a little bit different to what a lot of other people have said. To me, what makes the crash course special is that it connects all the dots. So I've heard lots of people write about fractional reserve banking or the Federal Reserve and the history of it or the energy system, which is a big focus of the crash course, or populations and demographics. But you connect all of the dots in the crash course, and that's why I think it's the best possible place to, to start for anyone who's interested in all of these things. Um, and I think that's what makes it work better than, than any other similar places, even that, you know, the, the creature from Jekyll Island is a great place to start. And for me, it was... Um, the what has government done to our money book, which was sent to me by uh, the editor of the Daily Reckoning. So um, it's a very, very similar story to my own, my own uh, journey then. And that's probably why the crash course worked so well for me as well. Let's dig into the, the key underlying idea of the crash course. If I had to rename it, I would call it the end of the exponential age. Explain why. Well, our money system, it really, everything is rooted in our money system. And <clears throat> Every money system has pros and cons, right? They enforce some behaviors, they punish other behaviors. Some really encourage saving, some encourage really, you know, burning through your principal. And so our, our money system, once you understand it and you unpack it a little bit, you realize it likes to grow exponentially. And this is very easy to prove with charts, right? Just pull up any country that has this, any country that has a fiat money system. Oh, that's all of them. 
you're probably going to pull up a chart that shows you how much debt does that country have, and it'll be compounding at some ridiculous rate. Here in the United States, for six decades, Nick, it's been compounding at about 9%. Now, if you like compounding, and you compound at 9%, it means you're doubling every, what's that, seven, eight years. Doubling. It's astonishing. So our debt's doubling, 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 right? 50 trillion becomes 100 trillion, becomes 150 trillion, just keeps going. I mean, 200 trillion, doubling. Well, that's fine. Well, how fast is our economy growing? You pull up the second chart, which is GDP, real or nominal, it's still not compounding at 9% a year. It's usually half that. So if you're a household and your credit card balance is compounding and doubling at twice the rate of your income, you don't have to be any sort of Malthusian energy expert to say, I have a math problem here, right? So that's part one. We have a money system that by its design is constantly growing its debt, its claims on money faster than it's growing its income, which is what the money is supposed to be arrayed against. You can do some financial shenanigans. We're coming at the end of the age of that. So I love that idea that this is the end of the age of exponential growth because the way you combat that if you're a central bank is you keep lowering the interest rates, right? If you if you can only afford 100 units of debt at 9% interest, how many units of debt can you afford at zero? Like a lot more. So that's how they've been keeping the game going, but they've been forgetting this one thing, which is that always, always, always the money system isn't a real thing. It's a human construct and its design is to be arrayed against the goods and services you would want to buy it, buy it with it. So those goods and services, that's what we track. Now we wander over into this world of the economy, right? So TVs sold, you know, massages given, university courses attended on the services side, pencils made and sold. How does that come about? And this is where my light bulbs really started to go off because when you unravel it, you discover energy is everything. So you need a lot of energy. Great. Let's just look over there and ask this question. Can our energy output compound at the same rate as our debt? If it could maybe we could make some argument that, that this could all sort of hang together. You can't, right? It doesn't do that. Our, our energy system had real obvious limits. And I talk to a lot of people in the oil business, presidents of major companies, and they'll, they'll tell you straight away, look, this stuff is just getting harder to find. It's deeper. It's, you know, poor quality sometimes, right? We're, we're literally in Canada, pressure washing tar off a of sand to get it that stuff. Would we be doing that if there was another Goar field like we have in Saudi Arabia? No, absolutely not. There aren't any more Goars that we know about. So I put all these pieces together from a top down and say, a money system that's compounding its debt at 9% in a real world that's growing at perhaps 2% on a real basis, these things are a problem, not a terribly hard prediction to make that you're going to have a math problem at some point. And my concern, Nick, is that the longer you wait to resolve that, the more you kick the can down the road, as we say here, the, the more you do that, it's, it's not kicking the can down the road. What you're really doing is taking another step up a ladder that when you fall off it, the higher the height, the worse the injuries you're going to suffer as a consequence. And I'm very worried that when this 40, 50, 60 year experiment with trying to grow our debt at twice the rate of everything else the debt's going to blow up at some point. Well, then what happens? I'm very worried about that because I think it means the system will be will be hard pressed to survive that. There's a good quote in the crash course which sum, sums up what you've just said, which is a very nice overview of the whole crash course. You happen to live at a time when humans will finally have to confront the fact that our exponential money system and resource consumption will encounter hard physical limits. That's a, a very easy thing to grasp when it comes to population growth. So can you explain, you know, this is the one that made the light bulb go off in my head because I, I vaguely get what the points you made about, about the financial system and the, the energy system. But it's a lot easier to understand the point you're trying to make when it comes to population because the, the population world inherently cannot grow exponentially forever. There is a hard limit. And so can you try and really simplify that point of anything that grows exponentially in the real world is going to have to at some point hit a limit? Yeah, this is a really important concept. So my 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 background, my PhD is in a biological science. So I took a lot of biology. So I come at this as a biologist might. And in biology, it's 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 very simple to understand that we we immediately go, oh, of course, there's a natural carrying capacity for caribou on an island. There's only so much they can eat there. 
And the natural population dynamics of those caribou, though, is that when the lichen is all there and it's good to eat, they grow their population and then they run out of food and then it crashes, right? And we watch those dynamics of population happen as a consequence of any organism running out of food. It could be yeast in a vat of sugar. And it's a party for a while. Their yeast is growing exponentially as a population. Then it runs out of sugar. Um, and so here's the issue for me. Oil is our sugar. We, if we're the yeast in this, in this analogy. So we're eating into it. That's fine. But we don't have a plan. We have no plan for what we're going to do when we get off it. We might have plans, but we don't have plans. And so that's the concern I have is that, is that this, our population right now is past its carrying capacity, given what we have now. Just opened the paper yesterday. The Midwest lost 60 billion tons of topsoil, you know, in the last few decades. Uh, one sixth of the world's grains are grown in the American Midwest on using water drawn from the Ogallala Aquifer, which is an ancient aquifer. It takes 10,000 years to recharge. We're drawing it down at about 5 or 6% a year. These are all just math problems or more rightly math predicaments, meaning you can't do that forever, right? We get back to Herb Stein. Anything that can't go on forever won't. Right, So we know we're going to have to stop drawing water out of that aquifer to grow grain. What happens when, we, when that happens? We, we don't know because we're at this stage of the story. There's no new Brazil to just plow down and start over. We, we, every arable acre we know about, and it's pretty much under production at this point, every aquifer has been tapped and is being drawn down. So now we're at this stage where humans have to come out of one story where we were like teenagers and our rooms are super messy. All of a sudden, this is our house. We're adults. We got to get our stuff together and we got to figure out how to behave so that we live within the constraints of the budgets we've been given. We have financial budgets, of course, but we also have ecological budgets and we have energy budgets. And those last two, we haven't really come to grips with yet as a species, any country. I'm not talking US versus UK versus China. As a, as a species on the globe, we, we haven't quite got there yet. Um, and no, Greta Thunberg scowling at us uh, to build more windmills is a not serious approach to this once you understand the math. Yeah, in the crash course, you cover, I think, that list you just mentioned, energy, money, and financial sides, uh, the demographics, depletion of, of natural resources and the natural world. We're going to focus on energy and the financial side in this because I think those are the two most interesting and relevant to the, to the listeners. But I really want to encourage the, the listeners and, and viewers to question anywhere they see exponential growth in, in, in their own personal lives, in, in their companies, wherever it might be, to think about the fact that at some point, you know, just by the nature of exponential growth, there's going to be some sort of constraint, some sort of limit. And the really rich point here is that if you build systems and social institutions and economic institutions that rely on exponential growth continuing, then when you hit that hard constraint, you're in deep trouble. Let's apply that to the, to the world of energy. And we'll start by explaining just how important energy is and why you call it or why it's been called the master resource. Yeah, um, the master resource. So one of the other things I did in, it, as a younger man is I uh, did some mountaineering. And when you're trying to scale a really tall peak, you have a calculus you have to run. And that is there's only so much you can carry. And the heavier your pack, the slower your progress, the less likely you are to make a, a window of, of time when the, when the weather is good. So you skinny some things down. The, the heaviest thing you're going to carry in there as a unit is going to be your food. So you make a calculation. How much food do I have? How many calories do I have in my backpack? And if you get caught in a storm that eats into two days of those supplies, you're, you're probably not going to make the peak, right? So when, as a mountaineer, as a human, this is when you know, like, my energy source, that food I'm carrying, that is the master resource when it comes to this particular game. And so you can only go as far as that energy is going to carry you. Now. Here we are in, in our current times, and you know, despite Teslas and solar panels you might see on roof and all of that, fossil fuels are still 80% of the world's energy mix right now. And we burn coal, natural gas, oil. In those things, though, oil is the master resource of all of those, because if we want to get more coal out of the ground, well, we got to make these really big digging machines out of steel. And we got to run them on something diesel at this point in time. If we want to build a wind tower, you have to still 
scrub out the land, pour a base that consists of steel and concrete. And you got to make this big tower and all these really expensive things. Oil's in every one of those things, including even the lunch boxes of the workers who show up to pour those concrete pads, right? So it's in everything. And right now, so this is, this is probably the most astonishing statistic I know. In 1930, before we really, really got into the energy age of oil, farming was a net productive energy practice for humans, meaning the energy from the sun would come down, be captured in the plants growing, and that food, when you ate it, there was a 10 to 1 return to humans. We would put one calorie of, of effort into the field, 10 calories of food energy would come out. That's a positive balance. Right now, that's completely upside down. We put about 10 calories of fossil fuels into every calorie we eat. So I'm walking oil. You're walking oil. Everybody listening to this, we're walking oil in the sense that it is our food system. I, I wasn't being sort of metaphorical with, you know, we're, we're eating into our sugar supply. We are. We, we humans need to understand we're living on fossil fuels because we invest those into food and we lose principal balance energy on that process. Trust me, in 100 years, food will be net positive again, but it's going to be a rough ride going from easy abundance to there. And so anybody, if you look at anything, anybody listening to this, look around your room and try and imagine anything you see in the room with you right now that got there without oil being involved, right? Without a lorry, without a ship, without a jet, without a manufacturing process, without plastic. It's, it's just in everything. And so because it's in everything and it's been in everything so long, my concern and the work I do in the world, Nick, is around, it's like water to a fish. We're unaware of it. But we need to become aware of it because we are now at the point where China has admitted they're at peak oil, Russia has admitted it's at peak oil, and the world's busy trying to like say, oh, we don't need Russia's 7 million barrels a day of exported oil. Well, true, as long as we don't mind oil going to 200 bucks a barrel, maybe 300. Um, and the shale plays in the United States, the executives have said, listen, we have two choices. We can either drill out every available acre we have in three years. Or we can stretch this out for a decade or two by being more conservative. But one of these, in the three-year drill out, we get more oil out of the ground for a bit. And the other one, they're fiduciarily responsible for their shareholders, and, and they stretch the, the earnings out over a longer period of time more responsibly. That's what they're doing right now. Um, and so we don't, the United States isn't a swing producer anymore. China and Russia have said they're at peak oil. India's a major consumer. In fact, every single OPEC producer right now um, seems to be at peak, and, and, and here, here's my data for that. They've had the ability to pump more according to their quota caps, and they haven't. They haven't. Uh, if, I mean, with oil over $100 a barrel, they have incentive. They haven't. And so now we see this huge geopolitical realignment. It has extraordinary implications. I think the petrodollar is in, in deep trouble as a consequence of this, which is a, another deeper conversation. But we're at peak oil. People need to recognize that soon because if you're, there are um, every single financial price of stocks or bonds to take the two biggest categories, those prices are predicated on this idea that we're going to grow in the future a lot. Otherwise, you can't make sense of a price earnings ratio of 20. That means I'm going to pay $20 to get $1 worth of earnings out of a company. So I'll have 20 years to get my money back. Well, in the next 20 years, you ought to be asking a question, what happens in the next 20 years? And I'm being generous. Obviously, you can find stocks with PEs of 100 or 200 or more, right? Those are pretty big bets that the future is going to be ginormous, you know? And, and the question we have to ask is, can it be? And once you understand the role of oil in fostering economic expansion, you have, there's a very serious question to be asked there. And, and my answer to it is, no, we're not going to experience growth like we have in the past. That's gone. We got to get that out of our thinking right away and ask the next question, which is what, what will prosper and what will prosperity look like in a future where there's not negative growth, but just no growth. That's the starting point. We have a plateau period for a while. Then we get into the negative growth part of the story. That's why you distinguish between the idea of growth and prosperity at the very beginning of the crash course. I don't want to get to, to the financial side just yet because I don't think the financial side relies on energy as much as um, as you're implying there. That that PE ratio of 20 presumes that earnings will grow 
otherwise it's not justifiable. And and even if if the energy system weren't in trouble uh, as as we both think it is, that's that's still going to be a bit of a challenge, I think. But let's focus quickly on something that you alluded to, which is the idea of net energy, the idea that it it, it costs some measure of energy to get a measure of energy out of the ground. And that relationship is actually more important than, say, the price of energy itself. Yeah, thank you. This is actually the, a core, core concept that, that's really important to get. And a lot clarified in my mind once I understood this. And so let's imagine, um, is a, by way of metaphor, let's imagine we're potato farmers, right? So if we're that potato farmer in 1930, we use our, our draft horse and our muscles, or maybe we use a small tractor and we plant potatoes, and we put one calorie of effort in and we get 10 calories of potatoes back out. Well, we still need one to plant next year, maybe one to live on for ourselves. So we'll keep two, but we now have eight. We have a surplus of eight. So because we have that surplus of eight, we wander down to the local village and we release those into the local village and it does whatever it wants to with those. It, it supports candlestick makers or barrel makers, or it could decide to hold, um, you know, dance troops, whatever it wants to do, right? That it's all of that additional activity in the village only can exist because there's surplus energy in this story. Let's make a couple of bad years. The farmer now puts a calorie in, only gets two back, needs both of those for him or herself. The village now has zero calories to live on. So in this story, it wasn't the farming that was important. It was the farming's surplus that was important. Same, same story, but now we go to oil. Back in the day, in the 30s, they would drill these you know, short wells, maybe 1,000, maybe 2,000 feet down, hit these gushers. We all saw those blow out, you know, those pictures of the, the Derrick rigs just spewing oil. And the point here is they would put a barrel of energy's worth of effort into drilling that well, and they would get up to 100 or more barrels back out. That's a hundred to one return. It's a 99% surplus, right? Um, that's amazing. And so that fostered a lot of that additional economic activity. Well, things are going along in the seventies. We're, you know, it's starting to tail off the, you know, we're not finding those huge, huge giant fields anymore, but yeah, we were still getting 25 to one returns. And then, I don't know, it's sort of, you know, by the early nineties, uh, we were saying maybe it was a 10 to one return. Now, when you look at something like, so in Gowar, I mentioned it once, in Saudi Arabia, that flagship field, 138 miles long, 50 miles wide, it's just a monster. They have wells there, Nick, that they drilled in the 50s that are still producing three or 4,000 barrels a day. It's astonishing. It's just a, you know, a couple thousand feet down. Now let's go over to, say, one of the shale plays in the United States, say the Bakken or um, maybe... Um, the scoop or any of them, really, they're all kind of the same. They drill down now, Nick, 10,000 feet, 10,000, turn the drill bit sideways, go sideways for another 10 or 20,000 feet, right? So they've drilled like this monster, monster, like miles and miles of, of drill pipe. They open it up. Ah, if you're lucky, you get a thousand barrels a day for the first month. Um, by the end of that first year, it's down 50-ish percent. By the end of three years, it's down 85%. And so where you had 1,000 barrels a day in that first month, oof, you have maybe 20 barrels a day coming out um, in three years. So, th But hey, that could still be economically viable. But think of the energy difference between putting a straw down, 50 years later, it's still producing, you know, 60 years later, it's still producing 3,000 barrels a day versus something you drill miles and miles of stuff, frack it, do all this crazy stuff, and it only produces for three years. Obviously, the net energy you get out of that first example in Saudi Arabia is almost infinitely higher than the net energy you get out of the shale. So that's where we find ourselves. We're, we're drilling in ultra deep water now. We're doing this, as I mentioned, pressure washing bitumen, which is a tar-like substance off the sand in Canada. The Orinoco Belt in Venezuela is like this really, really thick, heavy, very difficult to process stuff. What we're down to the, to the dregs in this story right? We, we've eaten the cream. We're just like any species. I have cows. They, they love to eat the fresh greenest stuff first, you know, and then that's how just how species do it. So we ate that. The freshest, greenest grass got, got mowed down in this story. And now we're down to the last stuff. This is an important phase change in this story. But the most important part, thank you for bringing this up, is we have less net energy coming out of that. And it's thought that we have returns that are maybe five to one coming out of our most recent efforts. Still worth doing, 
but it's not the same world when you had, you know, 100 to 1 returns. And if you looked at the chart of that, we said, well, you know, here's 98%, you know, 98 times returns, and then we're down to 75, 25, 10, right around 10, it goes, poof, and that net return graph falls off really quickly. It's not a linear chart. Again, it's a exponential chart, but it's one of exponential decline instead of increase. And, and as humans, we do linear better. So if I said 100 to 1, 5 to 1, a lot of people draw a straight line in their minds because I do. That's how we're built. It's not how it works. It falls off really quickly. And that's, again, my concern is that when things fall off quickly like that, our ability to process them individually, or more importantly, politically, uh, it's not good. We're, we're much better at the linear stuff than the nonlinear stuff. Let's take a cheap shot at uh, President Biden's policy to turn to ethanol to, to solve all this after uh, I try and sum up what you've said. So we've got energy is the master resource. Everything we do, it, it sort of comes back to how much energy is used in doing it. The problem we've got is that it takes energy to get more energy. Sometimes it takes a little bit of energy to get a lot out. But over time, as we use up the easily available bits, it gets less and less efficient. And so suddenly we're producing loads of energy just to get more energy. And that's taking up a huge amount, a huge amount of our productive capacity. The, the key is that everything that relies on that surplus energy, the easy availability of energy, is suddenly going to be in trouble as this efficiency declines because there's less surplus energy to do all of the other things that we want to do when we're spending a lot of our energy just on trying to get a bit more. So what's wrong? with President Biden's policy to, to add ethanol to the fuel base in the U.S. to try and solve all this. Oh, there's so much wrong. Really great summary, Nick. Um, so the problem is this. Um, in the United States, this is corn-based ethanol. So I got to distinguish because there's different flavors of ethanol. Some actually aren't that bad, um, but corn-based ethanol is a disaster. So what we're going to do, the simplest line is Biden is proposing that we take the last six inches of American Midwest topsoil and we put it into our gas tanks. What I mean by that is corn is a very soil intensive process, it takes a lot of energy to grow it. <clears throat> you know, we have to put fertilizers on it and you grow the corn and then you have to harvest the corn. You got to dry it. Then you got to put it into a fermenter and then you make ethanol. The most important part about this, besides, you know, doing something dumb, like using our soil to move our cars around rather than our bodies is this to make that corn based ethanol. When you, <clears throat> excuse me, run the calculations, it takes one unit of energy to create 1.4 units of energy. 1.4, the energy return is 0.4. 40% sounds good, but it's not. You can't run an industrial economy on a 1.4 times net energy return. The minimum seems to be around five. Things fall off and about, you know, we can't do it. Like this is really, really actually from an energy standpoint, it's just dumb. Politically, it might make sense. Hey, the corn farmers like it. The Midwestern senators and congressmen seem to like it. You know, there's a lot of money flowing. It, it makes sense from a bunch of dimensions, but it doesn't make sense from an energy dimension. This is where we're failing our IQ test politically and, and as a, you know, our, whatever went wrong in our education system, it's showing up now in these policies because these people have just don't understand the energy side of the equation. And that's going to be a huge problem for us going forward. I'm predicting, uh, you know, I've been predicting that we're going to have food crises. Those are parallel and they follow along the energy crises. I mean, just overlay a chart of global food prices and oil. And boy, there's a really high correlation, enough for you to go, I think there's a connection here. And of course there is. It takes a lot of energy to produce food. It's just converting one form of energy into another. Um, and we saw the Arab Spring, Nick, in 2011. That was in response in part to, you know, spiking food prices particularly in marginal poor countries where a lot of the daily earnings went to just feeding yourself. So 40% increase in wheat doesn't really affect people in our countries quite as much, but boy, it matters a lot if you're in uh, Tunisia or Egypt or some other place, right? And that's what we're seeing again, and we're unprepared for it. And of course, we have other global supply chain issues to sort of resolve uh, is noise and, and factors in the story, but it all comes down to energy. One of the key points that is playing out in the news right now that you make in the crash course is that when the energy system starts to go through these problems that we're talking about and there's less surplus energy available, that means that the rest of the economy has to become less complex. Mm. Now, it sounds pretty good. 
yeah, let's make things less complex. But we're actually experiencing right now you know, with this supply chain chaos, with the huge delays on buying a car and, and the food shortages and the, all sorts of shortages. That's what you mean when you say things are going to have to become less complex. Can you explain how what we're seeing in the news is related to the key points in the crash course? Yeah, that's you, you caught me in one of my euphemisms. When I, when I say less complex, what I'm really saying is uh, things are going to get a little dark. Um, I'm just so here, here's here's this is another really important concept. Um, there's complicated. That's one thing. A car might be complicated, but it's not complex. Complicated simply is a bunch of of many things sort of put together, but you can study them one by one and understand the whole. Complex refers to a system and complex systems. They have they're completely unpredictable. You can't we just they defy our ability to predict them as humans at this point. We've huge supercomputers. We still can't predict even very simple complex systems. And so complex systems have instead what are called emergent behaviors, meaning you poke at them and then you have to see what happens next, right? So humans are a complex system, right? So politicians will pass a tax law. Oh, we'll just do this. And next thing you know, humans being very clever, complex systems find ways around that. And so the, there's very few examples of direct connections where politicians put a policy out and they get exactly what they expected on the back end, right? And again, so, but that should be expected because we are a complex organism as, as in, in a society. That's what we are, complex. So we have to watch for what emerges. So that's part one about complex systems. They just have these emergent systems. We don't know what's going to happen. People ask me all the time. They say, Chris, predict what's going to happen when we have petrol shortages, you know, when diesel's in short supply. I'm like, I can't predict. It, we're going to have to watch, and then we're going to be surprised and find out that this factory closed down or that didn't get delivered or this. We won't know because it's it's inherently unpredictable. That requires a little humility on our part to to just say that. And then the second part is that all complex systems owe their complexity to the amount of energy that's flowing through them. So let's take the biggest system I know about, the whole Earth. It's this beautifully complicated thing. We got octopi that change colors. We've got, you know, dragonflies. We've got all the people doing their things. We've got smartphones. If the sun blinked out, though, that, that's our primary source of energy. If the sun blinked out, how long would it be before the Earth became simpler? Like eight and a half minutes, it would start simplifying, right? Um, so that's what I'm talking about. That flowing, the constant flow of energy from the sun allows all this complexity to emerge. Nobody could have predicted because we turned the sun on that we would have those octopi and the dragonflies and the smartphones, but those emerged because we had energy. So now we have X units of, of fossil fuels, X units of, of oil flowing through the system. The complexity is due to that. It's actually due to the surplus energy. We are now in a position where we're seeing less and less and less surplus energy. It doesn't go away all at once. Peak oil doesn't mean Tuesday morning we run out. We have less so everybody listening to this, we grew up in an environment where we had more, and that's how the world works. Now it's starting to become less and less, and that's a whole new regime, totally different world. So we're going to see this simplification process. So what do I mean? Right now, if we said, this cup has a stock keeping unit, an SKU, it's got a barcode. You go into a store, and it's got a little tag on the bottom. It's got the SKU, it's called. How many SKUs are out there right now? There's about 15 billion SKUs. Like if you went online and tried to order one of everything, you'd have to make 15 billion orders right now, right? Um, that's a lot of complexity. Uh, and so we look at that and as well, there are right now in the United States over 300,000 job classifications. Right? So when we put less energy in, we can't afford 15 billion SKUs. It'll go to 10 billion. Which 5 billion will go missing? I don't know, right? But that's a simpler world. There's just less complexity in it. Um, we might go from 300,000 job classifications to 200,000, then to 100,000. If we go back to the 1800s or prior, there's only like 30, you know? Um, so I, may, I just made that number up, but a lot fewer, right? You know, you had the, the farrier, the, the cooper, the candlestick maker, the doctor, very, but relatively few. So everybody listening to this has grown up in a time when we've had more complexity. And so we take that as axiomatic, it's automatic. We're, the future will just have more of that. That's Mark Zuckerberg, the metaverse. We're all just going to put little headphones, headsets on and live in this crazy, you know, uh, very highly 
complex world requiring immense complexity to maintain it, right? The server farms, the, the, the replacement of all the, all the uh, silicon bits, the energy required to run all of that is very complicated and complex. So this is a, actually a really critical point is that we're going to see this, this simplification process is going to start. And the way the people listening to this are going to experience it is things just get harder, right? You know, there's just like, you know, they can't quite find the budget. We can't do everything we want. We can't fight wars, cut taxes, and, you know, go in further in a deficit. Just, it just becomes harder. We're not ready for that as a, again, as a culture. So that's why I do what I do. I want individuals to understand what they can do because this isn't a, this sounds dark, but it's, it's just a change. It's going to be dark for people who don't see it coming, can't adapt to it, um, are inflexible. But for people who see it coming, I actually think this is going to be one of the greatest periods of wealth creation and transfer in human history. And so to see that, I think, is actually a, a great advantage. The easiest way to understand what you've said about the, the uh, dropping complexity because of a lack of energy is just the ability to move things around the world. So if, if we couldn't cheaply move things from China, then what would the world look like? Well, things would be a lot more expensive. And, and who has a job where and what that job is would dramatically change. And that's playing out right now, I think. Um, there's this shift to, to, to uh, onshoring rather than mm -hmm. offshoring, uh, and there's shipping rate issues, and obviously fuel fuel for um, for moving things around the world has dramatically been um, upended, and, uh, and therefore it's you know takes eight months to get a new car and so on and so forth, and th the same for the the computer chip uh, issues mm -hmm. as well. Let's turn to the financial side to make sure we get it in because that's really more our remit at, um, at Fortune and Freedom. I'm going to read a quote here which sums up the idea: all of the developed world stock and bond markets are priced with the implicit and explicit assumption baked in that there will be continued future growth in the economy, corporate earnings, the money supply, debt, and all the rest. But what if that growth never arrives? What then? Without robust growth, those markets will be worth a lot less than their current valuations. And that's a huge risk for individual portfolios, pensions, endowments, and even social stability. And I want to add there just the, the financial system itself, the banking system, and so on and so forth. Can you explain how the idea of, of, of exponential growth, uh, the reliance on it, and the end of exponential growth applies to the financial system? Sure. So let's take pensions. Um, a pension is actually uh, a combination of two things. It's a pool of financial assets and a set of actuarial assumptions. How long are the pensioners going to live? How much are we going to pay them out? And within that actuarial assumption, there's a financial assumption. And in the United States, still, unbelievably, they're holding on to this idea that there's going to be perpetual. They have a 75-year horizon. 75 years, that's a long time. These things I'm talking about, we're talking about, Nick, they're all happening now, and they're going to play out over the next decade or two. These people in the pension, by the way, I talked to pension, like groups of pension. I've talked to a trillion dollars under management in a room, you know, and, and they're wonderful people. And still, when you corner them, you say, how long, what's your horizon? They say, well, you know, our actuarial assumptions are 75 years. Great. So they take this pool of assets and the people that they're supposed to serve, and they say, we're going to, over 75 years, we're going to manage this all out. What's your assumed rate of return? It's usually seven and a half percent. They're going to have a 7.5% compounding of real returns within that portfolio. Great. That means every pension in the world is imagining, I can do the math in my head, that every 10 years, they're going to double the size of their pension. Double and double and double and double. So that's seven doublings. So if a pension's managing $100 billion, goes to $200 billion, $400, $800, $1,600, to dollars right? Massive. And they're all assuming this. So what happens if that pension doesn't meet its 7.5% return? Well, now it has a financial shortfall, and it usually has to make it up. If it's a company pension, it has to come out of company earnings. There's fewer of those to worry about these days. They still exist. But mostly these are uh, municipal or state or even federal pensions. And those, they still have to, it, it's like the math doesn't work. And so you can imagine that these pensions now have these giant gaping financial holes in them, if what we're talking about is true. And then those have to be filled somehow. So in that new future, though, you have the pensions alone have this gigantic demand, like huge demand for resources, simply so that retired people can continue to live the life they've, they expect and become accustomed to. But if you, where does that come from? 
Well, it has to come out of other productive enterprises. So at some point in the future, we'll be making trade-offs. Are we going to feed the pension beast or are we going to replace that bridge that just fell down? You know, th that will be the decision set we'll have to make. And, and the prediction is very easy to make. We're not going to feed the pension beast because we can't. We can't do everything in this in this future world. So uh, as I look around this right now, I mean, I couldn't believe it was just a year ago. I think we hit a peak of negative yielding debt. A lot of this was in Europe, right? Negative yielding debt. Took me a while to get my mind around that. I'm going to pay Germany to hold my money for a while. You know, it's just, it's a nutty concept. Anyway, that, that itself was sort of a microcosm of this thing. The only reason you would ever, ever, ever buy negative yielding debt is because you expect somebody to buy it from you at an even higher price. That is an even more negative yield in the future. It's an explicit bet on the central banks to step in and be that buyer of last resort at a higher price. Can they do that forever? No, they can't because as they continue to throw that more and more and more currency units into the system, but the system is no longer growing like it used to, this inflationary outcome we're at right now was the easiest thing to predict because I knew that the behavior sets of central banks was always, we'll just throw more of this stuff in. It'll all re resolve itself. But I'm over here tracking the real output of the real economy and using the, the price of the availability of oil and tracking its surplus energy and just seeing that squeeze down. Don't, don't forget, to, you know, for, leave price aside. Watching that happen and throwing more money in, easiest prediction set in the world. We're going to get into trouble. Now, as we get into, as we have, I don't know, was it like $290 trillion of global debt last I saw, and that's old, so it's probably well over $300 trillion now. All of that debt is sort of priced it may be half the stated rate of inflation, which I think is low, because I think uh, statistics are massaged. Uh, infl true inflation is actually higher. So bonds are now back to being certificates of confiscation, like they were in the 70s. If you own one, you're losing value. What happens when people start selling their bonds? Well, the prices go down. What happens then? Well, the interest rates go up. Central banks don't want the interest rates to go up. How do they stop that? Well, they have to buy some of those. How do they buy them? With currency, they printed clickety-click out of thin air. I'm, we're just watching that process happen over and over. The ECB right now is just busy just like throwing stuff in, an easy prediction to make. Um, ECB is going to keep doing that. And they're going to keep doing that till it breaks. But when it breaks, Nick, what happens then? That's, this was so easy to see coming. I think people need to be prepared for the idea that, again, just as we, for the past several decades, have been immersed in so much energy, we don't see it clearly. We've also been immersed in this idea that paper-based currencies and their derivatives, which are stocks, bonds, things like that, that's where you keep wealth. We're in the early stages of a story that says, oh, those are actually claims on wealth. What's the real wealth? It's the stuff you buy with them. Oh, how do I own that? Well, you do what Bill Gates has been doing for 10 years now. You buy farmland. Um, you buy real hard assets. You buy mining companies. You buy oil companies, not, um, not metaverse companies. You you uh, own more land. You can you grow, figure out how to grow your own food. You own gold, silver, uranium. Huge story in that, right? These are all all sort of the the plays off of that. But it's just getting our heads out of infinite growth. We can just print our way out of any problem. Over to the idea that now nah, these are all just these are ideas. Real wealth is always what real wealth has always been, and that's the stuff you buy with your paper currency. Readers of Fortune and Freedom are seeing the fact that I got all my ideas from you, all the good ones. <laughs> I'm going to sum things up quickly here. A monetary system which presumes exponential growth in a world with non-exponentially growing energy supplies is headed for either inflation or default. And it sounds like you're set on, on inflation. Um, you asked what the future will look like if, given all this. My answer would be Peru, Sri Lanka, and Japan. I don't know if you want to quickly mention what's going on in those places and how they relate to, um, to, to your theories about what's coming for us. Well, uh, Japan's a slightly different story on this, but but Peru and Sri Lanka are having the first of what we would call the inflation riots or slash the food riots. It's just that people who are already at a marginal edge of, of existence, when inflation gets beyond that level of comfort the, far enough, then you get what we call the food riots. But it's really just people protesting that the system is no longer working in their favor and that it's actually made their lives intolerable. Humans are pretty adaptable. Generally speaking, we're fine, but there's a point at which we break. And so I see in those stories, as well as others that are breaking right now, 
this is my model for how the world works. If you want to understand, like right now, is Germany going to get in trouble? That's sort of the core of, you know, a central reactor in Europe. Nah, you have to watch the edges because trouble always starts at the outside and it moves its way inward. So I call that from the outside in. To me, you know, if inflation really backs off, maybe Sri Lanka and Peru settle back down. But if it doesn't, you'll watch it move from Sri Lanka, maybe over into larger India properly. And then maybe, you know, we see the same thing in Pakistan right now. Um, they couldn't, they, they don't have, they can't turn their electricity plants on because they can't afford to import coal and natural gas. We're going to see a food riots, but these will be energy riots in this particular case coming forward. You'll watch that progress and progress and progress. And then maybe it's, you know, again, 2008, nine, we watch, well, Greece gets in a lot of trouble and then Italy. And so it progresses again from the outside in. So, so that's part one of this story. Um, part two is, well, Japan, <clears throat> Japan is, is uh, one of my favorite case studies because their currency is, is busy uh, falling quite rapidly right now, as it should, because the Japanese central bank has been printing like crazy to try and keep it all working. But instead, we should have backed up and gone, <clears throat> Japan is an interesting case study. Its population is actually declining. It hit a peak in 2008. That's a long time ago. And it's actually aging very rapidly under that. So, and as it ages out, you have fewer and fewer, if you looked at productive workers, which are people who aren't retired, it's nose diving in their debt and printing is going like this. And it's, it's, it's really dumb, Nick. I mean, it's just like Kuroda is attempting to print his way back to prosperity against every major prevailing force that should actually be driving the decision set, which is, well, maybe we don't need more debt to support more economy if we have fewer people who actually need that economy. It's, it's the tail wagging the dog, right? It should be the economy should be in service to the people. Instead, the economy is in service to the financial system. The financial system needs that printing. The people don't. So now we're watching that implosion of the currency. Um, and I think that that's the that's the story to watch. That's from the outside in. That could be the first major currency I'm aware of that could get into an actual what once people add the math up and they should have done this decades ago. But once you had Japan's math up, you're like, they can never pay that back. Right. Um, and if they can't, then what's the yen worth? And obviously, the answer is a lot less. So I think that's the early stage we're seeing there. But you know, the biggest problem, they're not recognizing the predicament they're in and adjusting their behavior. They're just doing more of what they used to do. They don't see the future they're actually in. So I'm in Japan and I'm originally German and I want to just support everything you said, except for the fact that the Germans are suffering. They've been asked to take shorter cold showers in order to fight Putin because of these energy shortages. So they, the Germans are struggling a little bit. Um, no, no, I, I, yeah, yeah, my wife's savings are declining in with the yen. So yeah. Yeah, let me let me be clear. Europe's policies around Russian energy is just they they haven't just shot themselves in the foot. They've shot themselves in both feet. Um, you can. This is one of the dumbest things I've ever seen. Uh, the European policy here is absolutely self destructive. You mentioned there at, at the end that the issue is that people haven't recognized that the world's changed. We've hit these hard limits. Exponential growth can no longer be presumed, and therefore we need to change our institutions in order to not rely on exponential growth. That's what you do at Peak Prosperity with your community that you've formed there. Can you tell us a bit about it and how people can find out about it? Uh, I'd love to. So I, I would describe our community as people who are curious. Um, so one of my favorite sayings about myself is the older I get, the less I know. Right. Uh, you know, I used to know a lot. Um, and now now it's just a world where we have to be very flexible, very adaptive, be ready to change our beliefs uh, and our opinions based on new inputs of data. Um, eight years ago, I would have told you New Zealand was one of my premier like sort of hidey hole places to go. Now it's no, uh, they've gone just completely nuts. And I've decided no. Same thing for Canada. So got to be adaptive. Um, and so that's our community, uh, Nick, we're very adaptable people who are just interested in like, where's this puck going? I want to skate to where it's going to be. So that's what we're trying to do is figure out where everything's headed. And our operative principle is prosperity. We all love to be prosperous. I think there's enormous opportunities and enormous risks baked in all of these twists and turns we're talking about. And so, uh, that's who we are, and what we do. You find that at peakprosperity.com. And um, we have a lot of free information there. I have a subscriber newsletter and, and behind the paywall for people who, well, let me be clear about this. There's things I can't talk about in public anymore. We've got censors on the loose here in the United States. 
Um, I've run afoul of them a few times simply for using my scientific background to discuss scientific things that are out there in the scientific community. Um, some of those have been declared off limits by the social justice gatekeepers that we have going. So um, that's why we have a, a website on our own where we can talk more openly <laughs> in an increasingly closed society. Yeah. I think if uh, if the, the viewers and listeners at home have been struggling with the, the supply chain crisis or inflation or the energy crisis or the lockdowns with the COVID, you should have been reading Peak Prosperity because that's where you will find the solutions. And I think Chris's message today is that a lot of those problems are going to get worse over time. And so you should be reading Peak Prosperity now if you're not already. Chris, thanks very much for joining us. And to everyone at home, thanks for watching. Thank you. Thank you.